the church was in trouble. Division arose which could have not only split the church, but stopped its mission. How would the leaders of the church handle this crisis? How do we handle crises in our own churches and in our own lives? This story can be a model for all of us. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15 and let's tackle this chapter. Good evening. Welcome to session 44 in our study of Acts of the Apostles. We have a lot of ground to cover tonight, so let's pray and we'll begin. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the faithfulness of your people <clears throat> who come every week to study. We pray that we will grow in our study of your word tonight that we will become more Christ-like all the time and we will have wisdom as we are part of your church, your holy church. Thank you, Lord, for the sacred trust you've given us as members of the body of Christ. In Christ's name we pray, amen. This 15th chapter of Acts gives an account of a meeting held in Jerusalem to debate and decide an important issue. <clears throat> were Gentile men required to be circumcised? And were Gentiles required to fulfill the law of Moses in order to be saved? The meeting was called because some Pharisees who had come to faith in Christ went from Jerusalem to Antioch to tell the Gentile believers there that they had to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses in order to be saved. You remember that the church at Antioch was the first all-Gentile church. Paul and Barnabas were at the church when these Judaizers came because they had returned to the church from their first missionary journey. And they debated with these men over the matter. Because they could not come to an agreement, the leaders of the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas and some others to Jerusalem to meet with the apostles and other leaders of the church there to decide the issue. Notice their willingness to submit to the authority of the mother church. That was good leadership. After considerable debate, some speakers made presentations in this meeting that was held in Jerusalem. The first speaker was the Apostle Peter, and we covered his speech in our, in our last session. Essentially, Peter rehearsed for his listeners what, had re, what he had reported to the Apostles when he returned from Caesarea and the house of Cornelius, who was a Gentile. Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius and his household with the intention of telling them that if all the men were circumcised and they went through the ceremonies to become Jews, and if they agreed to obey the law of Moses, then they could become Christians and they could receive the Holy Spirit. But before Peter could finish what he had to say, the Holy Spirit was poured out on that group of Gentiles before they could be circumcised. In other words, God didn't require circumcision from them in order to receive them into his kingdom. As long as they had faith in Christ, that was enough. Peter's conclusion was that if God did not put the burden of fulfilling the law on these Gentile men, then why would he? And why would those who were trying to do so at this time? Interestingly, Peter asks these Judaizers, why they are putting a yoke on the necks of these Gentiles. A proselyte, that is a non-Jew who was converting to Judaism, was said to be taking up the yoke of the kingdom of God 
by agreeing to keep the law of Moses. Furthermore, these Judaizers who were making these requirements were themselves guilty of violating the law of Moses, as we all are. They were asking the Gentiles to do what they themselves were unable to do. All right, that is a review of what we covered in our last session. Tonight, we want to finish our study of this meeting, and we want to look at the next speakers, Paul and Barnabas, together, and then James. <clears throat> So let's look at what Paul and Barnabas had to say. Now you remember that in chapters 13 and 14 of this book, we have the story of their first missionary journey where they preached the gospel to Jews first and then to Gentiles in the cities and towns of Cyprus and what is modern day southern Turkey or what has been called Asia Minor or Galatia, either one. Now don't forget that it was the Apostle Peter and the other Apostles who sent Barnabas to Antioch to pastor this church that consisted of uncircumcised Gentiles. And the Apostles never instructed Barnabas that he had to circumcise these Gentile believers. No such requirements were put on him. So in this meeting, Barnabas and Saul told a story of their missionary journey. And, verse 12, the whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. Remember the healing of the paralytic on the island of Cyprus that brought Sergius Paulus to Christ? Remember the miracles that were done in Galatia? in the various cities of Galatia as they preached the gospel to the Gentiles in the various cities there. Now what point was Paul and Barnabas making? Well their point was that God would never confirm Paul and Barnabas's message with signs and wonders if their message was wrong. If God wanted the Gentiles to become Jews first before they became Christians then he would not give his Holy Spirit to these gentles, as Gentiles as he did during this missionary journey. So whether you look at Peter's experience in Caesarea or Paul and Barnabas' experience in the, on their missionary journey, the conclusion was inevitable. Gentiles did not need to become Jews before they could become Christians. Now before we move on to what James had to say, let me make one observation. Peter, Paul, and Barnabas make their argument from experience. In other words, they have a testimony that no one can argue against. That is why I tell you that testimonies are a powerful spiritual weapon in our warfare against an unbelieving world. When we can say, this is what God did in my life, it's very difficult to argue against that. And that is especially true when miracles are involved. And that, of course, was the experience with Peter and Paul and Barnabas as they brought the gospel to the Gentiles. All right, having finished their testimonies, now James replies. Now we need to ask, who was this man, James? Well, we know that he was not the Apostle James. Herod Agrippa the I ordered the execution of the Apostle James in 44 AD. His death, the first death of an Apostle for the faith, is recorded in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. So who then was this man James? The only other option we have is that this James is one of four half-brothers of Jesus, the other being Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Their names are listed in Matthew chapter 13, verse, 50, <coughs> excuse me, verse 55. Because the name of Jude, uh, James appears first in that list, it is believed that he was the oldest of the brothers. During Jesus' life, James and his other siblings 
did not believe that he was the Messiah. In fact, the brothers challenged him and even misunderstood his mission. Let me read to you from John chapter 7, verses 2 through 5. Now the Jewish festival of booths was near. So his brothers, that is Jesus' brothers, said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, so that, you, so that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one who wants to be widely known acts in secret. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then John adds a little footnote to that statement. He says, for not even his brothers believed in him. But according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, Jesus, in his resurrection appearances, appeared to James. Eventually, James became the leader of the church at Jerusalem. And he was the leader of this council that was meeting to debate this issue. Now, James wrote one book, this James wrote one book in our New Testament, the letter of James. When you read it, you can't help but notice the Jewish flavor of the letter, which is explainable since he was the head of the predominantly Jewish church in Jerusalem. But when you consider that background, and his statement here in this 15th chapter of Acts, more weight is given to this statement. Here is a very Jewish believer admitting that Gentiles need not observe the law of Moses in order to be a Christian. That's a staggering statement. Let's look at what James said. I'm reading from verse 13. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon, now that's an Aramaic version of Simon, or Peter. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. Notice that James makes no mention of Barnabas and Paul. Those two men had no standing with this council. In fact, this whole hearing was about a problem that they, Paul and Barnabas, seemingly created. Peter, on the other hand, was the lead apostle, and he had already reported to his experience to the other apostles and had been approved by them. All right, I'm reading from verse 14. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. Now that's an amazing statement, especially in the original language, because it takes the language of God's selection of the Hebrew people to be a people for himself and applies it to the Gentiles. And then it goes on to say, this agrees with the words of the prophets, as it is written. And then he goes on to quote one of the prophets. Now James has done his homework. He knows the prophets. He quotes from the book of the prophet Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And I quote, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Now, if you were reading from the book of Amos, in Amos's day or in the days of these men at this council meeting, you would not have gotten the same message as James got from reading it. And here's why. When Amos wrote his prophecy, he had in mind the literal rebuilding of the place and the palace which David occupied when he was the king of Israel. The goal of rebuilding David's dwelling place was to rebuild David's kingdom so that, so that the temple would regain its prominence and people would come from throughout the world to seek and find God. But God could only be found in Jerusalem, 
at this at this temple. Now that is how everyone saw this prophecy from Amos. But as we saw in Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost, the restoration of David's kingdom under David's rule was impossible since David had died and was buried in a tomb in Jerusalem. How then would David's kingdom be restored? It would not be restored literally with David as the king, nor would it be a political military kingdom. It would be restored figuratively with Jesus as its king, and Jesus would open the way for all people, both Jew and Gentile alike, to seek and find the Lord wherever they were. They need not come to Jerusalem and to the temple to find him. And what that meant was interpreted for James and indeed all believers by God himself. When he allowed Cornelius and his household and all the believers in the church at Antioch and all the Gentiles who came to Christ on the island of Cyprus and in the region of Galatia to become spirit-filled believers without having been circumcised, without having to fulfill the law of Moses, and without even having to come to Jerusalem to find the Lord. Amos may not have understood fully what he was prophesying, but now, with God's help, these people could. In the Amos passage, nothing is said about circumcision, but God settled that issue once and for all. Here, then, is James' conclusion. Note the, note the tone of his language here is one of authority. In fact, it sounds like absolute authority. It's not, but it sounds like it. I have reached the decision, he says. Not we have reached the decision, but I have reached the decision. Now that must say something about the structure of the Jerusalem church in the absence of the apostles. Even Peter, who was sitting right there, did not make the decision. James made the decision. Now, James said that his decision was that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. Great. What else? We should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. Now, from a 21st century point of view, James' decision, or his edict, or whatever you might want to call it, sounds like he is saying Gentiles don't have to obey the law of Moses, but on certain points they have to obey the law of Moses. How could you have freedom from the law and then be required to obey parts of the law? And that is a significant question when you consider that the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were both enjoying incredible freedom to eat and fellowship with Gentiles with no restrictions on those Gentiles whatsoever. So what gives? Well, let me make two points. First, this sudden freedom that Gentiles had to intermingle with Jews, even if they were Christian Jews, was more than the Jewish community of Christians could take. They had lived for centuries under specific, specific dietary restrictions, social restrictions, and moral restrictions. Keep in mind that when a rabbi went to town, upon returning home he immediately took a bath to scrub himself down just in case he may have touched a Gentile as he made his way through the crowd. So how could they possibly have open fellowship with, with Gentiles? Jews were taught, furthermore, that God created Gentiles to fuel the fires of hell. When Jews in Jerusalem or any place else for that matter became Christians, they weren't laying aside their Jewishness. Some of them may have felt that they were more Jewish than ever. But suddenly, they're hearing that none of their Jewishness matters any longer. They're hearing that they can live as though unclean Gentiles have become clean. They were being asked to set aside much of their tradition which distinguished them from the rest of the world 
It was that tradition that identified them and no others as God's people. Now they were being told that none of that was true any longer. They were no longer God's chosen people. In fact, the people whom they hated, even despised and looked down upon ever since Abraham was now to be considered God's chosen people alongside them? For many Jews, perhaps most of them, that was too much to handle all at once. So James offers a compromise that would appease the extremists from both sides. Later, James' decision would be seen as an unreasonable compromise with the Jewish Christians. But for now, it would stand. Not only do we note what James said, we must also note what he did not say. James did not say, as we would probably have said, let's require these new Gentile believers to at least obey the Ten Commandments. Why didn't James include that part of the law in his decision? Well, I suspect that he left that part of the law out because it was self-evident that one should honor God and his name and not murder or lie or steal. You didn't, you didn't need to explain that to the new believers. With Paul and Barnabas having the most contact with Gentiles, it was obvious that they would teach their new converts the importance of keeping the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Incidentally, in his letter to the Gentiles, Paul reminds them that murderers, thieves, adulterers, and other habitual violators of the moral commandments do not inherit the kingdom of God. So, obviously, he had taught them the moral law when, when, he, when he brought them to Christ. There's another factor here as to why James did not include more regulations in his decision. And that is that throughout the generations, in cities and towns, throughout the known world, the law of Moses had been read and continued to be read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So an understanding of the law had trickled throughout the Gentile community as well. And it is likely that the tradition of reading the law every Saturday, soon to be Sunday, morning, continued in the new Gentile churches. All right, let's go back to James' statement. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble these Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. So, what he is saying here is that there is no shortage of understanding of the law of Moses, even among the Gentiles. So the decision was made, and all that was left to do was to communicate it to the church, especially the Gentiles in Antioch and in the churches that Paul and Barnabas had established. Note verse 22. Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. You really couldn't ask for a better outcome for this problem. Now, in order to maintain the highest integrity, Paul and Barnabas were not sent home along with the letter that was written by James and the elders of the church. No, they selected two of their members to go to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas to personally deliver the letter to the elders there. Do you see the skill they seem to have had in dealing with this problem so that there was going to be no misunderstandings whatsoever? They chose a man whose name was Judas, also surnamed Barsabas, who, by the way, is not mentioned again in the New Testament, and Silas, whose name becomes quite famous in the story of the early church, as we will see in chapter 16. These two men were among the most respected men in the Jerusalem church, and thus were entrusted with the responsibility of delivering the letter to the church at Antioch. 
Now, in verse 23 to 29, we have the text of the letter. I'm going to read it and make a few comments on it as I go. Let's note, first of all, that the, sender of the letters, senders of the letter were not content for Barsabbas and Silas to merely communicate the message of the, uh, from the leaders by word of mouth. They sent a letter, a written document. To the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. What's interesting here is that the letter was not sent to the churches that were recently established during Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. Now this is not to say that they were intentionally left out. It was the church at Antioch that had sent Paul and Barnabas and others to get a decision over this problem. And it was the church at Antioch that had sway over any believers in Syria and Cilicia. And it was to those church leaders and the Gentiles in the surrounding area to whom the letter was sent. Obviously, the message of the letter was intended for all Gentile believers in Christ, wherever they were. Now, the letter goes on. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us, though with no instructions from us, have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds, we have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So the purpose of this letter and this delegation from Jerusalem is to undo the damage done by those unauthorized representatives who started the problem in the first place. Furthermore, the decision of the leadership in Jerusalem was unanimous. No one disagreed. And then note the conciliatory statement about, and I quote, our beloved Paul and Barnabas, unquote. Paul and Barnabas could not have received a greener light to continue their missionary work among Gentiles than this statement. They were recognized as two men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas who themselves will tell you the same things, that is, the same things as were written in the letter by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit, that's verse 28. Now there is the phrase everyone wants to hear. Because this is not merely a human decision. It was not only the decision of James. It was not simply taken by vote of the people there. Here, as Luke always likes to do in his book, he points out that the Holy Spirit is ever and always guiding the church, especially in these major decisions that had to be made. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. That is to say, they accepted the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They were in agreement. To impose on you no further burden than these essentials. Now, what were those essentials? Let's look at them closely. <clears throat> we have already noted that they probably would not have been our primary choices, but they were the choices of these men under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. There are four abstentions. That is to say, four things that they must not do. What were they? First, they were to abstain from eating food that had been sacrificed to idols. Now, what was the problem here? Well, the problem here was simply a matter of conscience. And those who thought that eating food off to idols was okay would sear the conscience of those believers who felt guilty if they ate such food. And they, the, 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 the folks in Jerusalem didn't want anybody to have their conscience seared, which means they would make, it would be easier for them to commit other sins <clears throat> Paul, by the way, addresses this problem in his first letter to the Corinthians. In that letter, Paul tells <clears throat> these Gentile believers that if they are not aware that food had been sacrificed to idols, then they can eat it. Don't even ask. But if they were told that it was sacrificed to an idol, they could not eat it 
because doing so would offend those whose conscience forbade them from eating such food. So it was not a, a, a regulation that would, that would be in the church forever, it, but it was simply part of the, of the, of the historical uh, culture of that day. <clears throat> Second and third, they were to abstain from blood and from what is strangled. Now I think these prohibitions had to do with the decay of the animal after it was killed. So it was really a protective measure for them. But it was found in, in the book of Leviticus. And finally, they were to abstain from fornication. Now this one is a little more difficult to explain. When we think of fornication, we normally think of a couple engaging in premarital sex. It may have in mind, uh, but, but this word may have in mind, the incestual relationships that are mentioned specifically in Leviticus chapter 18, verses 6 to 18, in which he covers any kind of possible relationship, a person may, may sexual relationship, a person may have with a member of his family. The reason the writers may have had these sexual activities in mind is because it would have been widely understood already that premarital sex, in the general sense, was forbidden in the Christian faith. But these, these Gentiles coming into the church may not have understood that incestual relationships were, with members of the, of the family were, were illegitimate. Now again, other moral matters were not mentioned in this letter because there would have been no debate on the church, Jew or Gentile factions, about such matters as lying, stealing, murdering, etc. They all knew that those things would be prohibited. The letter ended with these words, If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So the delegation with Paul and Barnabas went back to Antioch and delivered the letter to the whole congregation. And when they read it, they rejoiced over its contents and did not object to any of the regulations that were included. Judas and Silas, who were prophets, in addition to the prophets who made up part of the congregation, provided substantial encouragement to the believers there. When they had finished their ministry in Antioch, they returned to Jerusalem, leaving Paul and Barnabas in the hands of the congregation to continue their work. All right. Now, verses 36 to 41 have to do with how Paul and Barnabas continued their missionary work. There's a problem there, as we will see. But, that, but those verses, 36 to 41, really belong to the next unit of the book, which is chapter 16. So we will take up those verses in our next session. Let's pray together. Our Father, we rejoice that this problem that was so threatening to the early church was handled so magnificently. It was handled orderly. It was handled with a recognition of the authority of the Mother Church in Jerusalem. It was handled peacefully. And those who heard the testimonies were willing to submit to the obvious evidence that God was leading his church to include Gentiles into its membership. O oh Lord, help us as a church to always be wise and to always seek your guidance when we face struggles and divisions and challenges, not only in the life of the church, but in our own personal lives, in our businesses, and in any other context. Thank you, Lord. For this great chapter, this important chapter in the life of the early church, we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining me for our study. Next week, we'll move on to chapter 16, finish up chapter 15, and then move on to 16, as we see now how Paul and Barnabas continued their ministry, even though they didn't travel together. We'll look at it then. God bless you. Thank you for joining me tonight. Goodbye.